Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me, Elena, and it's me and Chris and oh, we've got a good guest for you today who have we got on Chris absolutely we, we had so much fun chatting to Nathan Ammon oh god how long ago was it it was the autumn or the winter last year and we sat down to talk about Tudor rebels or the rebels against the Tudors and the princes of the tower and we had such a laugh we thought well let's bring him back and he can tell us more about because everyone know we all know about the later Tudors so let's let's talk about the rest of them the better ones possibly so uh, Nathan welcome back uh, thank you. I'll rather consider the topic today, the Ocean Vowel. In English, <laughs> yes. please. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I've got to tell you, so while we've been preparing for this podcast, uh, Nathan had to send me a voice note of Welsh names that he'd written down. I was like, yeah, no, I can't, I can't. And then we had a discussion over what's more difficult, Welsh or Polish? Um, I, I think probably the most difficult one, from what I understand, is going to be English. <laughs> <laughs> from, from everything I've, I've learned and heard from, from people trying to learn the language, I always feel like Welsh, and you suggest Polish, seems to get a bit of a bad rap for how difficult it seems. When Welsh is a, it's, it's a phonetic language, once you master the very basics, you can say any word. Whereas English, I mean, come on, look, look at some of the place names. Leicester, Bister, Slough. I haven't got a, you know, you, unless you, you, you were born as a native speaker, you haven't got a clue what's going on with how they spell some of those words. No, they're, all nor- they're all northern you- places. In, <laughs> yeah. in Kent, we don't have that. We have Maidstone, Gillingham. It's all straightforward. But north? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true, actually. Now I'm thinking off the top of my head, I can't think of anything in Kent. But, uh, There's nothing in Kent. <laughs> <laughs> m- m- maybe Heaver. You know, mm. w- w- what's going on there? Ever. Uh, it rhymes with uh, beaver. Heaver rhymes with beaver. <laughs> Jesus but, but, Christ. But, but, but it's, it's, it's like my surname. I mean, my surname's of Arabic origin, Amin. And how they say it out, um, you know, in the Muslim world, it is pronounced uh, Amin. Uh, as it's, you know, it's spelled A-M-I-N, but it's pronounced as if it's A-M-E-E-N. Um, so in England, I'm known as Nathan Amin because of the way just the English people pronounce a word with I in it. Whereas in Wales, because we do pronounce words with an I, with a double E, it actually works. So, like, you know, the Welsh and the Arabic get I mean right. But in, in England, I'm just Nathan Armin, and I've learned just to, uh, you know, just roll with it. Well, everybody's <laughs> been saying my first name wrong, and I shocked a couple of people because... In England, people say Alina, like how you pronounce A, but in Poland, it's Alina. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, anyway, look, I'm being forced to do the first question because Chris wants me to pronounce some Welsh later on, and right. that question then falls to me. So we're talking about the Tudors. We haven't done anything about Tudors in a while, so and they think you can have a bit of fun. So... <sighs> We know about the later Tudors, right, and the ruling of England and whatnot and whatnot, but we don't know much about the origins of the family. Well, we, meaning us, not you, obviously, because you know everything, nearly everything. You know a lot. You know a lot. So talk to us how they rise to prominence. I mean, it's really interesting. As we know, everybody, obviously the Tudors, is that ubiquitous subject to the point where a lot of podcasters and TV programme makers try to avoid the Tudors. But I always feel that they're really discussing the English Tudors, you know, the famous names, and they're the boring lot, really. You know, Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, they're the boring lot. We have we have so much more interest if we shine a light on the earlier Tudors, um, the Welsh Tudors, um, or rather to make things a bit more complicated, um, they weren't even known by the name Tudor, anyway, but I'll, I'll come on to that in a bit. Um, the origins of the family. So 
when he became king in, in, after 1485, Henry VII, um, or in Welsh, Harry Scythefed, Henry VII, he responded to so-called slanderous aspersions on his Welsh background by issuing a commission for people to investigate just exactly where his family came from. So we do have quite a good uh, document and investigation so that we do know where his family came from. Obviously, it does descend into a bit of a bit of myth at some point. Uh, you know, he's descended from King Arthur, and it claims that he's descended from um, Brutus, the mythical founder of Britain. But the first real strong ancestor we have for Henry the Seventh, and therefore every single British monarch after that, up to the present day, is a chap called Ednafid Vachan. Uh, Ednafid was a very important man in North Wales during the late 12th and early 13th century. He was, in effect, the prime minister to the, the princes of Gwynedd. Um, so during this time, Wales was a smattering of independent kingdoms, the most powerful being Gwynedd, North Wales, really. Um, and during this time, we had a couple of pretty decent princes, to be honest, um, until that... Uh, that Paul Ed of the first decided to come in and ruin things for us Welsh. Um, so, but we had, you know, we had Llewellyn the Great, and we had uh, Llewellyn the Last. Um, obviously, that epithet leads everyone to know exactly what happened to Wales in that he was the last independent ruler. Ednafid was, as I said, the most important figure in North Wales, who was in the prince himself. He basically governed North Wales on behalf of the prince, and he established um, quite an important family. You know, obviously, by him being this powerhouse, this political master in North Wales, he was able to raise his sons to be, uh, to follow in his footsteps, really. And what we start to get, is we start to get the development of this very important family in North Wales. Now, for convenience, we would call we we call them the Tudors, the Welsh Tudors. They would not have recognised that name because Wales back then was a country that used patronymics. Um, you know, for for example, Ednafed's son was called Gronwy. Now Gronwy's name would have been Gronwy Ap Ednafed, uh, Gronwy son of Ednafed, and then Gronwy when he had a son, he called him Tidir. So Tidir was known as Tidir Ap Goronwy. Um, or if we were to take it even further, Tidir Ap Goronwy Ap Ednafid. So that is, you know, Tidir, son of Goronwy, son of Ednafid. Now, in Wales, during this period, pedigrees and lineage are incredibly important to the people. Um, I think it was Gerald of Wales who said that there's nothing more important to a Welshman you know, right in about the 11th century, there's nothing more important to a Welshman than his lineage. It is worth more than all the, you know, all the gold and all the silver in the world. They they were deeply impressed by lineages to the point that they could recite orally their lineages going back eight, nine generations easily. I mean, I think I could probably just get to my grandparents and I start to get a bit confused about what's going on. Um, but the Welsh that was all they had was their lineage, their pedigree. It meant everything. So for us as a modern audience, it gets confusing. We like to box everything up into these simple, um, you know, the Tudors uh, as a family, as a dynasty. But to these guys, it would have been simply their lineage. Um, so we do get Ednafid Vachan, the powerhouse in the twelfth in the thirteenth century, and then gradually down the lines, we get this long proud lineage of Welshmen throughout the 12th, 13th and 14th centuries. Um, now, at the end of the 13th century, Wales does get conquered, finally, by the English. Um, it is quite interesting that when the Normans came over to England, they captured the country in a matter of weeks. Uh, 1066, England falls very quickly to the Normans. In Wales, they find it a lot more difficult to conquer the country. Um, you know, it's it's a mountainous region. Every time the English armies were 
invading, the Welsh could just retreat into Snowdonia and so on and just hide away. And the Welsh did manage to hold out a lot longer than in England. So it's only in 1282, really, does the last independent Welsh kingdom, Gwynedd, finally fall. What happens then is that Ednafid Vachan's descendants, his son, Garonwy, and his grandchildren, they are forced, you know, through for pragmatic reasons, to start serving the English crown. You know, they haven't got a choice anymore. You know, independent Wales, the dream of, a, of an independent Wales has gone. So they become servants to the English crown. Now, there is a bit of a problem during the 14th century in that the Welsh are no longer masters of their own domain. The English have come in and they've inserted many uh, English sheriffs, English bailiffs, English constables into North Wales. Um, it's obviously during this time as well, we get those famous large castles of Edward I that start cropping up all across North Wales. Um, Harlech, Carnarvon, Denby, Conway, you know, these are the, put there really to power the Welsh into submission. And, you know, it, 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 works, it works very well. But you do get this, this family, again, just for convenience sake, let's just call them the Tudors, um, this family who are operating during the 14th century under this English oppression. Um, you know, for, for most of it, they, are, they, they have no choice. But there are a couple of episodes that do show there's an undercurrent of ill feeling in North Wales. Um, in 1345, for example, two of Ednafid Vachan's... Um, let me do the mental genealogy. His grandchildren, um, a chap called Howell App. Uh, I've got to think now. Ednafed <laughs> uh, to Gronwy to Tidir. Yeah, Howell App Tidir and um, Gronwy App Tidir. They are brothers. And uh, they don't like this English oppression. They don't like that their ambitions are being thwarted. You know, for Welsh men during this time, there's very much a very low glass ceiling over what you can accomplish. You know, you're not allowed to do any official posts. Um, you are very much restricted in what you can do. And this comes from a family who once held incredible sway over this region. So one night, the king's, um, the king's administrator, a chap called Hugh Shalford, comes into North Wales to collect his taxes. And these two brothers uh, effectively ambush him and kill him. So they kill the king's administrator. And this causes quite a lot of upheaval and a lot of violence in North Wales. The king of England, however, obviously, you know, the most powerful man there is, we're talking about Edward III here, um, was unable to do anything against these two brothers because they were considered too powerful in North Wales among the Welsh. So even though they had no official offices, they weren't able to accrue any significant titles or money, they were still had their reputation amongst the Welsh, and that's all because of their lineage. Now, for me, just to sit back to Ednafid Vachan, the reason that this later Welsh generation, again, let's just call them the Tudors, the reason they did have this power among the Welsh was because Ednafid Vachan was a man of such incredible competence and loyalty to his prince, Prince Coelin of Gwynedd. He was given a wife. This wife was a daughter of the South Welsh king, uh, the Lord Rhys, Rhys Ap Griffith. So, you know, it's uh, as they seem to want, as they seem to do during them times, he was given the gift of a, of a wife. But this wife had herself a far more illustrious lineage, because the South Welsh king, the Lord Rhys, was descended from all of these famous ancient Welsh or British, Brythonic, kings, these famous powerhouses from the 7th, the 8th, and the 9th centuries. Uh, we're talking about kings like uh, Rodri Maur, uh, Rodri the Great, the only uh, Welsh king known as the Great, um, something he has in common with Alfred the Great. Um, and Howell Var. Now, anyone who's watched The Last Kingdom, they will know that 
during some of the seasons, however, or a very fictionalized version of him, uh, does crop up as the king of the Welsh. Um, but however, is probably Wales's most revered ancient king. And because Ednafid Vakan marries this death of South Wales, Gwenchian, their children now have in them, not only do they have this proud North Welsh um, background, they have significant royal Welsh blood in their veins. And this all is distilled and it comes down to the later Tudors that we famously know. Um, so that's a very long rambling overview of the, the, the origin, shall we say, of the Tudors as we know them. It really begins with Nafid Vakan in the late 12th and early 13th century. And through his wife, he, he is able to pass on to his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, just this proud lineage, this proud ancestry, um, and really a, a streak of stubbornness against what is effectively foreign rule. You know, they, they might buy their time in this family, they might play by the rules um, of England uh, as much as they can, because, you know, the, the might of the English uh, crown is far too strong for the Welsh to uh, resist during the 12th, 13th or 14th centuries. Uh, but it does keep in the family this idea of who they are and where they've come from. And this does eventually erupt very violent, violently in the year 1400. Can I ask a brief tangent question? Uh, you can, yes. <laughs> Okay, so Alfred the Great is only great because he was the master of his own press releases, basically. Did Roger the Great write, make sure his biography was written in the same way that Asa kissed Alfred's Asa? Because I, I, I'd like to think that Roger is a better king than Alfred. I'd like to think that this pen I'm holding is a better king than Alfred. But yeah, I, 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 made, I just wondered if there was a better case for Roger being greater than Alfred. What I find interesting is, as far as I'm aware, I mean, we're way outside my... Um period of interest. But I think Arsa was Welsh. Um, I think yeah. I might be correct to say yeah, that. So, yeah, so, so I, I wonder whether there's an element of perhaps in Arsa's work, he was mentioning these um, these Welsh kings, that's where some of their reputation came from. But I mean, in, in Wales, we, don't we didn't have the tradition of what Alfred did, which is putting down our history in, in writing. Um, in Wales, it was an oral tradition that was passed down. It comes back to this idea of pedigrees. So I don't off the top of my head when exactly Rodri Maur, Rodri the Great, first became known as Great. Um, I do know that, I think it's his grandson, Howell Var, which means Howell the Good. I believe Howell the Good, he was known as that during his lifetime because of the laws that he brought in. But I'm not sure exactly when Rodri, Rodri the Great was known as that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it started with somebody like Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, right in, in the 1100s. He was one of the first people to start putting down a lot of Welsh, Welsh oral traditions um, in, into the written word. I have another off-tangent question, <laughs> just because I can. How much does the Lost Kingdom, Last Kingdom, sorry, piss you off? when it comes to depicting the Welsh? Um, so I love The Last Kingdom. Oh, that's okay then. We can I, be friends. No, 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 I, I have a reason for this. I have a theory. My theory is that as anyone studies the period of history, I feel like if it's outside your period, you can just enjoy it. So, for example, obviously the Tudors is this famous program or the White Princess, the White Queen, all these things that completely turn the true historical subject upside down. I find it difficult to watch because I'm constantly looking for the mistakes, the errors. I, I think I think some people can get a bit too they take it a bit too seriously. I think, you know, these are entertainment. Yes, they do. They they can bastardize people's opinions of the period, but at the end of the day, these are really good gateway programs for people to get into the subject. You would like to think that the audience is watching these programmes and they, they do understand that it is fiction and it's not really based on the real people. Um, I kind of got to argue against myself because I know that not to be true sometimes because I take a lot of a lot of trouble on social media over 
um, what people think Margaret Beaufort was because of Philip Gregory books. Um, but when it comes to the Last Kingdom, because I know next to nothing about the Saxon period, you know, I know the very basics. Um, it means I could just enjoy it. I could sit back and cheer on this weirdly accented chap called Uhtred, son of Uhtred, son of Uhtred, mm. son of Uhtred. But when it does come to how well that popping up, that's when I suddenly sat up and went, hang on a minute, this is not correct. He didn't do this. He didn't do that. Um, so, yeah, so I do love The Last Kingdom. It didn't quite piss me off super much. I would have loved far more of the Welsh put in there. I thought they made this out to be a bit a bit barbarian-like. Um, but at least, at least how of that um, came off quite well. His brother seemed to be a bit of a wrong one in that. Um, and obviously, I love the fact that they had uh, Dave Coaches, um, Stefan Rodri, uh, a great Welsh actor play play how well that. I like that. You know, it, it's always good when you get a good a good South Welshman playing a great South Welsh leader. Um, inspired casting. So yes and no. Okay, so I'm going to try and dra- drag it back a bit. Um, <laughs> we'll just go down tangents all day. So it, it would be fair to say that during the English administration of Wales, that ten- there was quite a few tensions between the Crown and the Welsh. How did the the Tudor family sort of weather this? and their loyalty to the English crown as well. So, so yeah, so the 14th century, is a, you know, it's a full century, the first full century of all of Wales being under English rule. It's a bit complex because the concept of Wales itself, as we understand it, still doesn't really exist at this time. Uh, Wales, in effect, is, is split in half. Half of Wales um, is known as the March, which is owned directly by um, English lords. And the other half of Wales is now owned by the English crown. So you still get this weird situation where parts of Wales are directly under the rule of the English kings. Uh, and during this century, we're talking uh, Edwards, one, two, three, and then Richard II. And then in the March of Wales, so, you know, we're talking what we'd call today Pembrokeshire, uh, Gwent, Monmouth, uh, and all the way up the borderlands. They were ruled directly by English lords who could do what they wanted when they wanted in their land. They ruled these independently of the kings of England. So you end up having a country with incredibly diverse legal systems and levels of oppression. But it does create this tension throughout the country of the Welsh. who are basically having, you know, the foot, foot on the neck kind of scenario from English official dam. And it just keeps on bubbling up. There's very little they can do about this because they simply don't have the wealth or the power to fight back until the year 1400. So something interesting happens in this year. There's a chap called, um, well, the English know him as Owen Glendower, um, which we could thank Shakespeare for that. But to us Welsh, he's known as Owen Glyndur. And Owen Glyndur was effectively... The chap living in 1400 was the greatest Welsh royal lineage. He was somebody who could draw uh, descent from three different royal Welsh houses. But everybody knew this because the Welsh were proud of their lineage. Now, at this point, he's in his 40s and he has had quite a good uh, career of service to the English crown because that's what you do in the 1300s, you have no choice other than to enter the service of the English king. You know, that's the only way to get any get ahead in life. But the pressure on the Welsh is getting too far, again, too much. And in 1400, Owain Glyndur suddenly declares himself a Prince of Wales, and he raises the banner of rebellion against the English crown. And very quickly, much of Wales flocks to his side. We suddenly have, um, you know, it, again, words are quite important, but it's always been characterised, uh, perhaps in English uh, historical circles, as a Welsh revolt, Glyndur uprising. There is an element in Wales that's known as the last war of independence. You know, it was this last, last chance uh, gambit after a century of English rule to try and take back uh, Welsh independence. 
Now, Owen Glendur's first cousins are our old friends, the Welsh Tudors. So, so during this period that we're talking about 1400, there are five brothers, and it's at this point that they start to be called the Tudors of Penmanev. Now, Penmanev is a village on Anglesey where these five brothers were based. And the reason that they become known as the Tudors is because their father was known as Tidir. So these five brothers that we have, um, we have Gronwy, Ednafid, Rhys, Gwilym, and Maredith. And because their father is known as Tidir, they are known as sons of Tidir. So, for example, uh, Maredith is Maredith ap Tidir. So this is very important for later on in our story. Their father is known as Tidir. Um, and these brothers, they decide to join their cousins Owen Glyndwr's war. And in fact, they are the driving force behind it. Very quickly, Owen Glyndwr finds himself in a spot of bother and his rebellion after a couple of weeks fizzles out. On April Fool's Day, 1401, uh, Conwy Castle is probably one of the biggest you know, symbols of English domination in North Wales. During a religious service in church, all of the English guards, the garrison, have gone to church. And suddenly, two Welshmen rock up to Conway's great gatehouse and say to the two English guardsmen left that they are carpenters who have come back to, to finish off uh, some work. And these two English guardsmen decide to open, uh, you know, raise up the portcullis and let the carpenters in. And as the carpenters or in inverted commas, carpenters, rush in, so do a gang of Welshmen. And these are a gang of Welshmen led by two of the Tudor brothers, Rhys and Gwilym ap Tidder. They rush in, they slit the English guardsmen's throats, and lo and behold, a small gang of wily Welshmen have conquered one of the most impenetrable fortresses in England or Wales during this time. And suddenly, for a couple of weeks, Rhys and Gwilym ap Tudor of Conway Castle, and this is a huge embarrassment for the King of England. Um, and they effectively leverage holding this castle to try and gain a pardon from the King of England. This, by taking this castle, this really it reinvigorates the Welsh movement. Suddenly, Owen Glyndw resurfaces from the mountains. The Welsh um, rush to his banner. And what, we, what follows is a 10-year campaign, a military campaign, you know, Owen Glyndwr's Wales against um, Henry IV's England. And it is, you know, it is a very vicious and violent war. Uh, it is the war that gives uh, Prince Henry, the future Henry V, his first taste of warfare, which he would obviously go on to use to great effect in France. So we remember today in England and in Wales the wars of 1400 to roughly 1410 as Owen Glyndwr's revolt. But it was, in, as a matter of fact, equally a revolt led by his cousins, uh, the, the Tidir brothers of Penmanev. Uh, in fact, you know, two, the, two, the two elder brothers, Ednafid and Gronwy, they had died by this time. Uh, one of the brothers, Gwilym ap Tidir, we don't know what happens to him, he disappears. Um, and one of the other brothers, Rhys ap Tidir, he is executed in Chester. Uh, he's caught and he's executed. The youngest brother, Maredis ap Tidir, we also don't really know what happens to him. We assume that he dies, but he does leave behind a young son. And that young son is Owain ap Meredith or to give that full name, Owain ap Meredith ap Tidir. And this young boy, he, effect he effectively becomes uh, a young economic refugee. You know, Wales is left smouldering in ruins after the collapse of the revolt. You know, the English are, in the end, quite comfortable winners. You know, they, they do suppress uh, Glyndwr, they destroy the rebellion, and they impose severe sanctions on the Welsh people. Uh, we call them the penal laws. You know, the Welsh people are effectively 
uh, destroyed under these sanctions. So there's nothing left in Wales around 1410, 1412 for any ambitious Welshman. And suddenly we have this young boy, Owain Apmeredith, who disappears from Wales and he surfaces in England, where we suddenly move on to the, the next very exciting chapter in our family story. Okay, let me get this right. Owain Ap Meredith. Uh, the Meredith was good. Uh, Owain. Owain. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about Owain. And because the British or the English know him as Owen Tudor. Exactly. So tell us about his life. I mean, he disappears and then he resurfaces again. What the hell, basically? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't know when or how he, he disappears. We just know that because of later history, he clearly does disappear from Wales. Um, I believe that he surfaces in the household of an English noble called um, Walter Hungerford. And it is possibly through this connection with the Hungerfords that Owen suddenly gets work in the household of the then Dowager Queen of England, Catherine of Valois. Um, Catherine of Valois is the widow of Henry V. She's still only in her early 20s at this point. And somehow, some way, there's many stories about how this occurred. Somehow, uh, Owen at Meredith, who by now is starting to become called Owen Tudor in English circles, um, Makes, makes her fall in love and she falls in love with him and um, they they connect somehow a lowly Welsh squire, the son of a Welsh rebel no less, falls in love and secretly marries uh, the Dowager Queen of England, the mother of the current King of England, uh, Henry VI. I mean, how you go from within 20 years to being, you know, son of a Welsh rebel to being stepfather of the English King is astonishing. I believe there's nothing, there's no story quite like that in English or Welsh history. And that's the story that no one's putting on TV. I don't know. That'd make a really good TV series, actually. Bollocks to the, the what is it, the White Queen, the uh, whatever the other ones are. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love it because it's not my time period, but this sounds like, holy shit, he could have been like a rebel and escaped. And there's so much you could work with for TV. It, it is insane how fit for TV this story is. You know, a, a nice eight-part uh, series. It, it's the content is all there. It just needs to be put up into, into screenplay, really. If they can put Natalie Dormer in it, I'll watch it. <laughs> well, come on, <laughs> Natalie, Nat, Natalie Dormer can play Catherine de Valois. She'll have to put on a bit of a French accent. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I wonder who we'd have to, we'd have to get someone you know quite charming and charismatic to play Owen Tudor. There's plenty of those kind of Welsh actors out there. I don't know Luke Evans and all, or or that lot. They could uh, rock up and play him. My, Michael Sheen's probably get on a bit too much now, but um, mm. he, he could play him in later years. We could we could we could do the whole story. <laughs> I'm certainly trying to shortlist Welsh actors for my brain falls apart, uh, but. We should move on to one of history's greatest liars in the form of Henry Tudor. What was his early life like? Um, so, so Henry Tudor, obviously because Owen Tudor marries Catherine de Valois and they have children, um, two of their children are Edmund Tudor and Jasper Tudor. Again, I'm using the Tudor name. They would not have known that name themselves personally. Um, Owen Apmeredith Aptidir, his name does get contracted by English clerks to be called Owen Tudor. They've just got confirmed and they've given him the surname of his grandfather, Tidir. So, you know, but by all accounts, Owen Ap Meredith Ap Tidir, his real surname should be Meredith. He should be called Owen Meredith, not Owen Tudor. Um, he has two sons, which we call Edmund Tudor and Jasper Tudor. In their day, they would have been known by the names of their birthplace. So we have Edmund of um, Hardham and Jasper of Hatfield. They're both born in England. And they go on to get raised as the, the half-brothers of the English king, Henry VI. So straight away, they are inserted into English no noble circles. 
again, just within one generation, we've gone from Welsh rebels to English nobility very quickly. Edmund Tudor, um, fl fl flicking forward quite a lot, he does have one son, and that is known as Henry, um, Henry of Richmond, because Edmund becomes the Earl of Richmond. So when Henry is born in 1457, he is known from his birth as Henry of Richmond, not Henry Tudor, Henry of Richmond, um, because that is the, the family title that he has been born into. Now, his father predeceases him. His father dies a couple of months before he's born. And Henry's born in a very inopportune moment because civil war is, of course, brewing in England during this time. The War of the Roses, uh, the conflict between York and Lancaster. Now, Henry's position is very precarious because at the time of his birth, he is very deeply involved, um, obviously not through his own choice, in the House of Lancaster. Uh, as kind of mentioned, his uncle is Henry VI, the Lancastrian king. His other uncle is Jasper Tudor, who is Henry VI's half-brother and his number one supporter. On his mother's side, so Henry's mother, Margaret Beaufort, Henry is related to the whole Beaufort clan. And the Beaufort clan are, again, one of the main driving forces behind the Lancastrian faction during the Wars of the Roses. So Henry is very much a, you know, this kind of like Beaufort, Lancastrian, Tudor child at the outset of the Wars of the Roses. And this does make him quite a, it puts him in a very precarious position, shall we say, throughout this period. And it is because of this, he does eventually at the age of 14 have to escape his homeland and flee to France because the House of York are watching. You know, the House of York are aware that this kid, because of his mother, Margaret Beaufort, does have a claim to the throne. Already, very few people are caring now about Henry's Welsh ancestry. Nobody cares about that anymore. You know, everyone in England during this period, and I would argue to the present day, and now I've, I've already shifted their focus to Henry's English connection. There's his English connection that he eventually claims the crown through. However, one person who doesn't forget the Welsh connection is Henry himself. There's very good reasons to put forth the argument that Henry, throughout his life, and even as King of England, was always and remained always a proud Welshman, aware of the family history that we've already spoken about. And I'm happy to give you plenty of uh, evidence to that effect. Yeah, I think we're I think we're going to come along, come up to that. But his journey to the, because uh, like you said, he he was an obvious claimant for the crown. But his journey to the crown was was not an easy one, was it? I mean, it was very difficult. Like I said, you know, he was he was chased out of Wales at the age of fourteen, and he spent, uh, you know, he spent fourteen years in exile between the ages of fourteen and twenty eight, away from everything he'd ever known. And this is a very tough exile. Now we all know that medieval prisoners, medieval noble prisoners, weren't exactly kept in dungeons, but their movements were very restricted. And Henry was moved around from castle to castle in Brittany throughout the 1470s and the early 1480s, kept under the careful watch of guardsmen because he was wanted in France. The French king wanted Henry because Henry, through his grandmother, Catherine de Valois, was a cousin of the French king. And the French king wanted to get mitts on Henry so that he could effectively use him to go to war with England. Henry was also wanted in England by the House of York because they probably wanted to kill him. Uh, the House of York, during this period, had effectively wiped out the entire Lancaster leadership. Uh, they had murdered Henry VI. They had killed Henry VI's son, Prince Edward, um, the Lancastrian heir. They had completely decimated the House of Beaufort uh, in the main line. So, you know, they were House of Beaufort also had royal claims. They got rid of them. The only person standing left to potentially trouble the House of York at this time was Henry Tudor. Yes, his claim to the throne was far weaker and obscurer uh, and more obscure than the House of York's, but he, he was still there and he was out of their grasp. He was over in Brittany. 
So Henry, during his 14 years abroad, was in a very tough position. Two powerful kings wanted him for their own reasons. Um, and he himself was just cooped up in, I mean, I'm sure they were lovely chateaus, um, but he had no, he had no, he had no um, control over his own destiny until 1483, when a very naughty boy called Richard III decides to become king. And suddenly Henry's fortunes really are transformed. So Chris has put in this question. I don't know how you're going to take it. It could go either way. So I'm interested in knowing, would it be fair to say that Henry was the first Welsh king of England? I, I, I think absolutely. Some people try to make the argument for Henry V, because Henry V was born in Monmouth. Um, yes, Monmouth is a part of Wales, and therefore by birth, we can make the argument for Henry V. We also have Edward II, who was born in Carnarvon, uh, very famously. So, you know, by place of birth, an argument can be made for Edward II and Henry V. Um, if we use that as a, as a rule, then there's a lot of kings of England we would have to consider to be French, um, or even in Edward IV's case, um, he was born in Rouen, another French king. I think the reason that I would accept uh, and really put forth Henry VII, Harry Seisfed, as the first Welsh king of England is because that's how he, I believe very strongly, viewed himself. Um, obviously, nationality and it is a very complex discussion, even in the modern age. Um, I think my personal views will always come down to I'm happy for if someone considers themselves to be of their nationality, then I'm happy to go with that. But I do understand it's quite a complex discussion. Henry VII, he viewed himself as a Welshman. We have so much evidence um, about that. I mean, this is a man who, when it came to choosing his personal emblem, the personal badge of how he wanted to portray himself to the world, he chose a massive Welsh dragon. I mean, that, that's pretty much quite conclusive. He named his son Arthur. He did an investigation into his Welsh lineage. He was the first king of England to reward Welsh people on a lavish scale. It is only after the Tudor accession in 1485 do the Welsh really push on. Uh, no king of England gives more grants and makes more opportunities for Welshmen than Henry VII. He even gave money. Again, we're talking about a king who apparently was the most miserly um, and avaricious king in history. He's a man who gave plenty of money to his own household servants so they could celebrate St. David's Day. He's the first king of England we know that marks St. David's Day, the, the national day of the Welsh. Um, so I think, yes, I would consider Henry VII the first Welsh king of England. Yes, he was born in Wales, but so were other kings. But more importantly, he himself viewed him as Welsh. Um, so, yes, I, I think... I, 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 I mean, obviously, that's my opinion, but I find it very difficult to argue against that. But you're welcome to try. We could spend another couple of hours going back and forth. So, so it'd be fair to say that his ascension to the to the English crown was possibly the best thing to happen to Wales in a long time. Uh, yes, I mean, very big discussion, the Tudor session and what it meant for Wales. Um, it's very divisive today still because what eventually happens is under Henry VIII, we get what's wrongly termed the Act of Union. Uh, in truth, the, the, the Laws in Wales Act, where in 1536... Wales is effectively fully annexed and merged into the Kingdom of England. And that's, that's a situation that remains to the modern day. That's the reason why there's no dragon on the Union, on the union flag. You know, Wales is represented on the Union flag to this day under the English St George's Cross, because in 1536, we were fully annexed and united into the Kingdom of England under Henry VIII. So when you speak about the Tudors today in Wales, 
But two days are in a really weird position because in Wales, too many, they are the people who are the cause of much of modern Wales's wars. I mean, Wales is, you know, it's the poorest part of the United Kingdom. It's, it's an area of the United Kingdom that has long struggled economically and so on. And a lot of this is put down to the Tudors. And they were the people who caused this by making us part of the Kingdom of England. In England, I think historically, the complete Welsh background and connections of the Tudors has been completely dismissed. It's been ignored. Um, you know, I could argue that I'm a Welshman with a chip on my shoulder, but I think I'm fairly, fairly accurate in saying that we have been completely written out of the story historically in England. Luckily, today we do have far more diverse voices and so on. We have podcasts like yourself as well as give uh, shine a light on that story. So it's a bit of a weird scenario. I think, personally, the Tudors, or Henry VII at least, was very good for Wales. And the reason for this is context. Now, yes, we can, we can sit here and argue all day long about the current issues of Wales. Um, I'm, not, I'm not a historian of that, you know, of that wide um, economic knowledge to be able to argue back and forth. I'm just a bog-standard Welshman with my views on things. Um, I, I would put a lot of modern Wales wars down to the Industrial Revolution, how you know, it very quickly came into Wales and very quickly left behind the scars of that. The Tudors, Wales in the 15th century and the 14th century was a very difficult place to go. Yes, Owain Glyndwr captured the imagination of the Welsh with his uh, war of independence, but he left behind a very, very poor and fractured country. And he left behind a country that suffered very heavily under the punitive laws imposed on it by successive English kings. When Henry VII becomes king, he starts to undo some of that damage. He starts to undo a lot of the laws that really restricted the Welsh people. You know, Welsh people were not allowed to marry English. They were not allowed to own any property. They were not allowed to, um, they were not allowed to become any of the, the civil offices that people need to become successful. You know, Welsh people were not allowed to become sheriffs, they were not allowed to become bailiffs, they were not allowed to become constables, and so on. It was a very restrictive life that they had. Henry VII starts to unpick some of this, and it becomes fully unpicked under Henry VIII and those acts of union. You know, Wales is finally allowed to have exactly the same levels of equality as English people. That only happens in 1536. So yes, Wales didn't become this wonderful, independent utopia under the Tudors that some people um, desired, both back then and today. But it does, at the end of the day, just become equal with England. And for the Welsh in the 16th century, that was more than enough. Because what we start, suddenly start to see for the first time in the, 1600, in the 1500s, under the reigns of Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, and we start to see Welsh families really emerge on the national scene. The most famous of them is uh, the Cecil family. Um, you know, very famously, they become the power behind the Elizabeth throne. They were Welsh. They were of Welsh descent. Um, um, William Cecil's grandfather was called David Sesecht. And that was a Welshman who joined Henry Tudor during his march to Bosworth. So you got these two men marching to Bosworth. Henry Tudor wanted to become king of England, and he got David Sesecht, just an everyday Welshman. Within two generations, you know, Henry Tudor's granddaughter, Elizabeth I, is on the crown, one of the greatest you know, monarchs Britain has ever seen. And at her side is William Cecil. Um, you know, the the legacy of this Welsh takeover, really, of the crown in 1485. So I think, categorically, the Tudors were good for Wales when placed back in the context of their time. The wars of the modern day is a completely separate story, and I don't think that we can pin that down 
very simply to Henry II to become a king in 1485, which is what happens. A lot of people just simply say Henry II was terrible. I mean, what was the alternative? Henry II doesn't become king of England. We leave it to Richard III, and the Welsh continue to live under punitive penal laws for, for, for how many generations, how many years? Um, so yes, but that's just my one man's soapbox opinion. But based on a based on a hell of a lot of reading and a lot of research. Oh wow, this bit. But no, I'll start again. Um, <laughs> yeah, this has been uh, really in depth, really interesting. Um, we've got a lot more questions than we've got time for, unfortunately. But we should definitely maybe do another couple of episodes. Um, Alina's nodding, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> we should. Uh, yeah, you have to come back and tell us more about different parts of Welsh history because it's kind of horrendously underdone at times. This is normally the bit where I say. Can you remind everyone the title of your book? So if you've got anything you want to plug, uh, feel free. Uh, yeah, so I have, I'm just about in the process of wrapping up my next book. It won't be out until next year, I'm afraid. But uh, surprise, surprise, it's based on everything we've just talked about today. Uh, it's called The Son of Prophecy. And it is essentially the story of where we started the podcast. So it's a story of Adnafid Vachan, and I trace it all the way through to the Battle of Bosworth. It is the story of how this one Welsh family became kings of England. And it's known as the son of prophecy because on his way to become a king of England, the Welsh bards started claiming that Henry Tudor was the son of prophecy. He was the national deliverer, a second Arthur who had come back to save the Welsh from their, from their horrible oppression by Saxon, Norman, English forces. Uh, and there's good cause to believe that he himself viewed himself as the son of prophecy. I think that's a pretty good title. So yeah. watch out for it. Yeah, you, know, you have to come back um, closer to the time and we'll uh, we'll do another one and to, to plug it. But yeah, thanks for coming on and talking to us about a period that I don't think many many of our listeners will have thought about. No problem. Thank you very much. And the good thing is with all things Henry Tudor, that does seem to be a lot more interest these days than I was 10 years ago. So I'm happy to keep on coming back and banging that early to the drum absolutely no no fat ginger guys with beards here well apart from me but that that doesn't count <laughs> our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book this is just a small taster as a result we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests latest books you can support them and you can support us on history hack 10 percent of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.